Hi everyone, I'm Parag with Webgility. This video is being recorded as part of a series called Beat It. We're talking to business owners and experts in retail and e-commerce on the impact that COVID-19 is having on their business and the industry. We'll get a first-hand look at the actions they're taking and get real advice to help you beat the crisis. So let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Brittany Brown. She's the founder and CEO and chief accountant for Ledger Gurus. She's a CPA, QuickBooks Pro Advisor, and certified in all the versions of QuickBooks. She's got a team of over 45 people that help you fully manage your small business accounting. And I'll take a pause there and uh, introduce you to Brittany. And if you want to say something else about yourself, Brittany. Yeah, sure. I, I think you did a pretty good job. The only thing I would add to that is that we do all of that from home and around five kids who are all a little half crazy right now trying to figure out how to homeschool while we also figure out how to run a business while we also figure out how to like survive everything that's happening right now. So yeah, sounds like uh, you've got some experience dealing with remote work. Uh, but yeah, certainly having kids is quite a big change. I've got right. a uh, I've got a toddler who uh, who's very difficult to manage, but you know my wife and uh, I are kind of juggling duties right now, trying to trying to make it all work. Yeah. So if I have a surprise visitor come waltzing in here, it's because the toddlers cannot be reasoned with, and no matter how many times I tell them not to just walk in, I they just they they I can't keep them out even if I try. So I apologize in advance if we get surprise visitors. No worries, no worries. It'll make for a more fun video. Um, so uh, jumping right in, um, first and foremost, I'd love to learn a little bit more about what your thoughts are on COVID-19 and yeah. how is COVID-19 impacting, first of all, your business? And then we'll, if you want to share a little bit about how it's also impacting your customers. Yeah, so it's, I mean, COVID-19, I think the, the thing that's been the craziest about COVID-19 is that we literally went from a boom economy to a crash economy like overnight. And that has been, um, well, in my lifetime anyways, I've never experienced anything like that. And for us as an accounting firm, we have kind of a, not kind of, we have a front row seat to how our customers are doing. We know probably their sales trends as well as they do. And, and we understand I mean, already going into it, we already knew who had the healthiest balance sheets, who had the best profitability, who was most likely to survive. But what's been really surprising is to see, um, for example, which clients have taken off in this situation, which ones have crashed, which ones have had a huge boom as a result of this. Things that I w wasn't expecting. For example, we have a, a client that just sells betting. They have almost doubled in sales since COVID-19 started. And I wouldn't have thought that betting would have been considered like an essential product, but um, they're doing really, really well. But some of our other clients that sell like um, sporting goods, for example, have had their sales basically drop out completely overnight. Um, shoes that are higher end, bags that are higher end have had their sales drop out completely overnight. Um, but it's just been really surprising. There's been, there's, there hasn't been a really consistent pattern across our clients. There's been probably a more consistent pattern across industry like product types with our clients, but they have been, some of them are having the best days of their lives and some of them are, are having to basically shut their doors to try to survive this right now. Yeah. It's sort of a tale of two different uh, kind of businesses right now. Um, do you, do you have a sense that uh, is this sort of uh, the uplift in certain categories in your opinion, kind of negating the downturn or do you feel like everybody has been hit to a certain extent? Well, even those who are experiencing more success than normal, I think, are still very wary because they are still, um, like the upturn that they've had today could, could disappear tomorrow. So one of the things that we've noticed a really interesting upturn in is in beauty products. So beauty products have shot up, but like if we never leave our house again, do I really need lipstick ever again? Do you know what I mean? So like yeah, yeah. it's... Um, even those who even those who are experiencing increase of sales that are not in quite the same panic, everyone's confidence has definitely been impacted. 
Yeah, confidence is uh, definitely key here, especially as consumers are trying to just grapple with uh, what's going to happen next, right? And Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of fascinating. We're seeing, you know, different parts of the country shut down over a different period of time. And we certainly won't go into politics today, but uh, uh, just now, you know, seeing over 90% of the United States under lockdown, it's changing really buyer behavior. It's changing consumer sentiment. Um, when you think about your clients, are they um, are they mostly in e-commerce uh, primarily? Is are they also in brick and mortar businesses? And and can you talk a little bit about what's happening on the on the brick and mortar retail side? Yeah, so our clients um, are mostly e-commerce, but we do have several that have have brick and mortar as well. Most of our clients that have brick and mortar are not necessarily running their own storefronts as much as they're selling into brick or mortar businesses using EDI. So like selling into Macy's, selling into Nordstrom's, they basically have those part of their businesses evaporate and dry up completely. Um, our clients that are, are, are selling into um, bigger chains have, have had to really rely on their, on their e-commerce sales to get by because as far as the brick and mortar goes, whether it is their own store or whether they're selling into other people's stores, if you have to go into a store to get it, it is not selling right now. Unless it's toilet paper, then you're golden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that 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 remains a mystery to me. But, I know. Uh, I agree. But uh, so it sounds like there's definitely a, a lot of impact across different categories. Um, do you feel that uh, retailers are reacting fast enough? Do Do you feel like they're prepared for what's to come, or or are are they sort of uh, still lagging? You know, that's a that's a good question. And as far as like whether they're preparing for what's to come. Um, like, like the advice, so we just, we just launched a, a, a webinar series where we're like basically providing financial guidance to businesses. It was directed at our clients to try to help, but we kind of invited everybody. And, and the purpose of it really is to help people understand how to change the mentality of their business to survive this period of time. And specifically what I mean by that is so many of us up until even a month ago were really investing in growth for the future and a boom economy and, and, and kind of taking bets on, on growth by doing things like investing in infrastructure, investing in, in staff, investing in product development, investing in all these other things. And, and the point we've really been trying to drive home lately is that profitable businesses are sustainable businesses. And investing in growth is a great strategy when growth is an opportunity, but when you suddenly find that corner turn and you have to focus on sustainability instead of um, growth opportunity, maximizing opportunity, you have to focus on survivability. It really comes down to aligning your costs with what your sales actually are. Like a lot of our clients, probably one of the most interesting things about such a shift that we've seen lately is that it used to be that our clients were really excited and really interested in like how to drive their sales up by investing in marketing initiatives, by entering additional channels, by doing everything they could to drive their sales up. Well, so many of our clients right now are in a position where even if they were to invest a whole bunch of money in marketing, it would not necessarily drive their sales up. It doesn't matter how much Macy's puts the products that's in their store on sale right now, people are not gonna walk in the door and buy products from them. And a lot of our clients are in the same boat. Like if they are not considered um, critical or like there's just not a lot of opportunity to just increase market demand for their products right now. And so what we've been telling people is you really have to learn how to adjust quickly to bring your costs in alignment with what your sales actually are and what your sales, um, like what you can do around sales right now. You're, you're better off right now trying to trying to bring your costs in alignment with your revenue than you are with trying to drive your, re- drive your revenue up to cover your growth costs. Now, since you mentioned most of your customers uh, tend to be e-commerce or are selling to big box, um, do they have very heavy kind of uh, expenses in terms of payroll um, or are, are you seeing kind of an impact on, on personnel uh, in, in, in the community that you work with? Yeah, so I would say how heavy their payroll costs are, are is really dependent on how aggressively they've utilized the outsource environment available to e-commerce businesses. If they're doing their own warehousing, if they're doing all their own shipping, their staff levels are likely to be a lot higher. If they were using 3PLs, if they were using marketing agencies, their staff 
tends to be a lot lower. Um, very few of our clients have actually been manufacturing their products. Most of them were outsourcing. A lot of them were outsourcing from overseas. So our clients actually started getting hit financially before everything shut down because their, their, their supply chain dried up in many ways because China was the first one to get hit. And so they couldn't get the, they couldn't get the items that they needed. I remember reading that Apple, like that they, they couldn't get iPhones anymore. Like it's just the supply chain was impacted first and then, and then the customer demand was impacted next. And so it has been, um, I don't remember where I was going with that. It was going to be great. And I just, it left my brain. No, no. I think you were, you were talking about the impact on employees and oh, yeah, the more, right. Yeah, the more uh, you're right, absolutely. If if there's a really large footprint in either on the brick and mortar side, in which your case uh, there's likely not, but if fulfillment is in house, uh, mm -hmm. then you're going to be spending a lot of your uh, obviously your payroll is one of your biggest expenses and potentially even uh, rent because yeah. uh, you know those warehouse right. spaces t tend to tend to be a pretty large expense. Um, as you look across kind of the marketplace, do you feel that uh, there are certain uh, d does kind of now give you some some hope for more hope for e-commerce and do you see brick and mortar retailers kind of being more severely hit with contrast with those that might be diversified um, oh yeah uh, what are you seeing yeah oh I, I would say in general I feel like our clients are doing significantly better than the rest of the industry like if you're a restaurant you're toast right now if you are you know a massage parlor a nail parlor like so many of these services have really, really been impacted. I feel like our clients as a whole, because they are e-commerce, have done significantly better than, than most of the other industries that I'm aware of right now. And, you know, another thing that is, is great is that as far as the, the largest stimulus opportunities that are coming down today, you know, today is the, the launch, the go live of the, the Paycheck Protection Program. And that's the one that's the SBA forgivable loan that can go up to $10 million per business. That is designed to cover primarily payroll, but also rent expense on warehouses and, and, and some of those other things. And so of the expenses that an e-commerce business is likely to have that are not expenses they can shed easily. So, um, you know, if I have if I'm using a marketing agency, it's easy for me to cancel that contract. If I'm using a 3PL, I can reduce my cost of the 3PL by just not bringing any more product into that 3PL. So of the costs that e-commerce businesses are, are unable to shed easily, they are, they are expenses that are easily covered by, this, by the PPP, basically. And so I feel a lot of hope for e-commerce businesses because they don't, have, um, they don't have a lot of fixed costs typically. And of the fixed costs that they do have, those are the exact costs that are likely to be covered by the PPP. Yeah, this is exactly what we're seeing kind of across our customer base as well. Uh, I did an interview just last week uh, with one of our clients who's got multiple retail locations, but uh, he's seen a tremendous drop in revenue. But the fact that he's diversified across seven different e-commerce channels, he's got some revenue and he can at least sustain some part of his payroll. Right. Um, and, and hopefully this PPP program really comes through. I know it's day one and there's a lot of news and a lot of things that are changing about the PPP program. Uh, but just real quick, uh, just so I'm clear, it's about two and a half times of payroll. And uh, are, is there some clarity uh, do, can you provide in oh, terms yeah. of uh, forgiveness and, and any other yeah. details that might be helpful for the viewers? Yeah, so we've been tracking this really closely. In fact, I just launched a Facebook Live this morning. I was up to 3 a.m. last night watching the updates and trying to figure out what was happening. But basically, it's it's just it's right around $250 billion is what they've issued as, as able to go out to small businesses. The focus of it is small businesses and specifically the goal of it is to help small businesses keep their employees on staff. My guess is the reason why the, the government is investing in this so fully is because they either invest in this or they pay all the unemployment claims that come out one way or the other. If, if employees can keep their, if employers can keep their teams on staff, then when all of this settles down, they're able to hit the ground running a lot more effectively than if they send everybody away, um, close all their offices, do everything else. And so it's 2.5% um, of your average payroll in 2019. And um, 
Uh, just correct. I think it's 2.5 oh, times sorry. your monthly payroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, yeah, it's, it's probably lack of sleep. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. I'm so tired. <laughs> 2.5 times um, average monthly payroll in 2019. And some of the costs that, that, that are eligible to be covered by that are um, payroll, obviously, mortgage interest, rent, utilities. Um, it has, um, as far as things that are factored into that payroll, it's not just payroll and wages, it's also commissions, it's also benefits, it's also 401k plans. It's, it's anything that was a specific cost to keep your employees as considered either wages or part of their overall benefit plan. And so it, each company can get up to $10 million in, in revenue. Um, as far as the forgivability of it, um, that will really depend on the way that the money is spent within the first eight weeks after your loan funds. And from everything that we've seen, as long as you're using that primarily for payroll, and when I say primarily, I think the last number I heard on this, and this changes all the time right now, is that no more than 25% of the loan could be used on anything other than payroll for it to be forgivable. So 75% or more needs to be used on payroll um, within those first eight weeks after the loan period ends, after the loan funds. And um, you know, the, as far as the term of it, the interest rates, it, it literally changes every couple of days. And we, we've already heard rumor that it's gonna change again, even after the loans have started to issue. So I would say in general, like just plan on using it for payroll and you're going to be good. We've had a lot of companies say to us, yeah, but I don't, what am I going to use? What am I going to use the payroll for when I, you know, don't have all this product to sell? And internally for us, we're using it to basically pay our people and we're going to be building up all of the stuff that we haven't had time to do normally. Content online, better processes, better systems, so that when we do, able to go back to normal, we've had this period of time to be able to really invest in the infrastructure of our business and hit the ground running on the other side of it and, and let our people that we've spent so much money, time and energy training, stay engaged and stay involved. Yeah, I think that part of the economy, especially those that have employees, and you know, we saw the unemployment claims skyrocket uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, mm -hmm. to all-time highs, and and so really, it's I think it's a great initiative to help those businesses and help those individuals who are um, you know really going to be struggling to make uh, make their uh, even their monthly rent. Yeah, um, right. it's really tough out there, but I think one really positive thing that that you've talked about it sounds like because your customers are heavily invested in e-commerce they're seeing a lot less of the hit so that's that's sort of fascinating that um for those that that haven't ventured into e-commerce or that are tied very much to their brick and mortar business um it, it sort of really uh, doubles down on our thesis that it's, it's, it's really time now to accelerate oh, that yeah. move towards e-commerce. Right. Yeah, I would definitely say that. I think that one of the biggest learning periods of this time is a couple of things. The businesses that were least impacted by it were those who were already remote, whether it was that their workforce was remote or whether it's that they were selling on online channels. Those who were already in that space, I think have been able to slide more easily into the new age. And one of the things I'm hoping comes from all of this is that businesses spent the time going online when they maybe hadn't made the efforts before and that other businesses that had service products have spent the time and effort to get their staff up to speed, to allow more people to work remotely, to allow it to be more of a global economy, to allow us to reduce our carbon footprint overall in general, because we're now able to operate more effectively online in all ways across every area of life. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, something that I've been sharing with my team and just to share, you know, give you a quick overview. I mean, we're a global team. We've got, uh, we're fully remote here in the Bay Area, but we've got offices in, in Arizona and India and uh, with a team of over 150 people. Uh, we sort of had to overnight accelerate the move from from being in one physical location uh, in a few different offices to now going fully remote. It's been it's been uh, rough just transitioning that many people and and just getting all the infrastructure. But yeah, it's it's sort of fascinating. I feel that this uh, this time you you talked about the carbon footprint. So there's sort of the 
uh, fascinating kind of, you know, on the one hand, the, the, the tragic impact that it's having on all of these businesses. But then on the other hand, you're seeing uh, just an acceleration of, of the move towards remote work, um, the embracing really of you know, the sort of balance of, of staying home, spending more time with family. And uh, I, I guess uh, the, the toughest part, of course, is, is uh, those businesses that are really going to have a tough time surviving. And right. I think about those brick and mortar retailers that, that maybe were always, uh, you know, kicking that e-commerce project or their move online uh, down the road. And that's kind of really hit them hard. So I, 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 was, I was hoping we could dive in a little bit to that. And especially with your experience with QuickBooks and with uh, helping retailers in their e-commerce site. So could, we, uh, could you talk a little bit about, you know, if I'm a brick and mortar business right now, my stores are shut. Um, what, what are some, some proactive steps you would recommend that, that they should take uh, now? And uh, also, if we could talk a little bit about some sales channels, things that you think they should do in terms of steps to taking their brick and mortar business and, and now really starting to go online so that they can hopefully ease the blow of, of no revenue. Right. So the, the good news is if somebody is a retail store, I feel like they've already done the hardest part, which is to come up with a product, to establish a supply chain, to understand the value add of their products, to understand how to market their products. All they need to do is to figure out how to now advertise that online. Um, they probably even already have the warehousing capability right now without making any additional investments because they probably have the back of a store, a retail store somewhere that already has this product sitting in it. So in many ways, you guys, I'm speaking now to you guys who are going to hear this, like you've already done the hard part. The hard part really is product, product demand, sourcing the product, vendor relationships. Like all you have to figure out now is, is, is how to then communicate and bring clients into your, you know, your Shopify store instead of your brick and mortar store. And so good news is you have lots of time on your hands. Other good news is, is that you have the ability to now have your employees paid over the next two months without them having to generate revenue to produce, um, to justify their paycheck. This is such a great time for you to use the resources you have available of people with available time and an understanding of product that already exists and all the other things you already know to launch this. What you really need to do is to figure out how to get your product online. So whether um, that's a, but whether you, go onto marketplaces as well as build up your own stores through your website. Um, I, I don't necessarily have an opinion one way or the other. All I would say is, is yes, get on, get online basically. Actually, I probably do have an opinion. I would probably say I would invest most heavily right now in getting your own store up and going as far as Shopify, WooCommerce, BigCommerce, whatever that is. Um, Amazon is really favoring right now products that are essential and also like just our experience has shown us that our clients who do a really effective job of running their own internal stores, they typically enjoy better margins than they do when they're selling on marketplaces and they have a lot more control over their brand and their pricing and everything else. So people tend to jump on Amazon first because it is in many ways the fast, easy way to get online. But with it comes a whole lot of challenges that um, can be hard to unravel when it's all said and done. If you can spend the time and energy right now, launching your own your own branded store that i think is what will really create long-term sustainability and profitability in the long run yeah that's fantastic in fact just recently i did a video on choosing the right e-commerce platform again part of our beat it initiative because i think a lot of information out there so many different platforms so much talk about different uh, solutions, but really the choices are very simple. There's only a few platforms that really make sense if you're now getting started in your in the e-commerce world, and and, and I would second that. Uh, obviously, we're seeing some data firsthand on um, how you know individual kind of brands and retailers that have their own store are performing. Uh, personal personal experience. I just uh, you know bought this microphone stand and I couldn't get it on Amazon, so I had to go straight to the retailer. Yes. Um, and you know they're shipping out fast. It's a it's clearly a non essential, but um, we're seeing a, a tremendous increase in in uh, volume, as you pointed out, on individual stores compared to marketplaces. And I, yeah, you're right. Uh, right now is the time. In fact. 
Uh, this is why we've partnered with a number of web developers and designers, and they're uh, going to offer packages for as little as 500 bucks uh, to just oh, get somebody that's got a brick and mortar store, just get their catalog up quickly, uh, get their site launched so they can start to direct some of their traffic and really start thinking about marketing channels. Um, you talked about marketplaces, and I know y you and your team do a phenomenal job in, in helping sellers on Amazon. Um, as you think about the actual retailers and, and stepping back maybe into the back office on their accounting, on their inventory, I know one of the fears that a lot of the folks have is obviously there's the marketing side. How am I going to actually sell my products online? But then how am I going to take care of my whole back office? Um, and I know you guys provide some services there as well, but we're, we're, we're going to stay a little bit away from the sales plug today. Uh, right. Really focus on what are some things, maybe some quick tips you could share on what can retailers do to really prepare for the e-commerce world? Yeah, so probably one of the biggest things is that I think in the retail space, um, the point of sale system has 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 a long history of um, being being a core part of their tech stack, right? And and the point of sale is often tracking their inventory as well, and it's tracking their sales, and it's pushing usually into some sort of like um, desktop based accounting software like QuickBooks Desktop. But as you go online. The, the world changes significantly. Um, you, you definitely have, um, instead of having one point of sale system where all of your sales are coming through and all of your inventory is coming through, you now have all, the, all of these different channels that you need to be able to track information from. And now you have inventory that's in all these different multiple locations. And um, one of the mistakes that we see people make is that they don't understand that they have, a, they have, they have problems to solve not only in the operational side of things with logistics of where's my inventory, what warehouses it's sitting in, um, where are my sales coming from, but they also need the, the complexity around tracking the information from all the way through to the financial side just became more complex as well. Um, this is one of the things that we really like about WebGility as a partner is I think you guys do a great job of, of gathering all of that financial information into one place so that people can then decide what they want to do with it, whether they want to push it into their QuickBooks, whether they want to just keep it in WebGility and, and look at the data as it's moving across, whether they want to push it into you know, QuickBooks one by one on sales orders, whether they want to summarize it. These are all things you guys need to consider. And as you, and, and there's, this, there's this great continuum now that needs to be solved from operational maturity that just got more complex. You don't have one warehouse anymore on the front of your store that it's all coming into. You now need to consider all of these other things. So I recommend, um, like one of the things is just get involved with groups that have e-commerce sellers that you can ask questions, that you can ask them what tools you like, how they're solving this problem. But consider not only the problem that you're going to experience as the seller with the logistics, but also the problem you're going to experience as your own accountant, whether you're hiring somebody or whether you're doing it in-house that all of that data also has to be tracked and that it, the, the environment you just landed yourself into operationally and financially is a little more complex than the one you were just in. I actually think that e-commerce, well, I don't think, I know e-commerce is the, the wave of the future, right? Like more and more businesses are selling online, more and more product is happening online. And some of the wonderful things about being in the e-commerce space is exactly what I talked about earlier, which is the ability that they have to outsource so many parts and pieces of this. It used to be if you were gonna have a product, you had to first figure out how to become experts at manufacturing, and then you had to become experts at warehousing and pick, pack, and shipping and, and, and all of those other things. Now you only have to figure out how to successfully design a product, how to successfully source that product, and how to successfully sell that product. Like everything else around that space, you can outsource, you can, um, you can develop, um, tools and resources to make that process easier. But I would say consider the complexity of the world you just landed in from an operational and an accounting perspective. And WebGility is a great solution to help in that space. Um, that's more of a sales plug for you than it is for me. I hope you meant when you said don't be a sales <laughs> plug. I hope you yeah, meant nah. Not yes. myself. No, right no, no, no. We're we're gonna step away a little bit from from agility, but really, you you talked about you know businesses moving uh, 
online and all the things that they can do to prepare. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that I think is, is, uh, comes as a surprise, I think, to a lot of people is sales tax as well. Oh, yes. When they're in a brick and mortar business, it's all kind of built into their point of sale. They don't have to think much about it. But right. uh, can you talk briefly about you know, what happens to sales tax the yeah. moment I decide to sell online? Yeah, so this is why this environment is so crazy. Is It used to be that the rules around sell tax mostly had to do with physical location. Basically, if you had a brick and mortar store, if somebody walked into your store and bought something from you, you were charging them sales tax. And, th- and that was really the only thing you had to think about was that your point of sale had the ability to charge sales tax. When you go online, you are now a national brand. Like you are now selling to people all over the place. And, uh, and initially, you know, when the rules were still kind of mostly based around location and physical nexus, that was not really a problem. But last summer, when all of the laws came out that basically allowed states to determine for themselves what created nexus responsibility in their state, every state was basically like, hey, like, I want a piece of this action. Like, all of the sales now are moving online. They're moving out of the, the retail stores, and now all the sales are happening online, and we want a piece of this action. And so what they ended up saying is that if you were doing enough business in their state to justify what they called economic nexus, then they had a right to say, you now have nexus in our state and we expect you to be gathering sales tax on every cell that happens within our state. So it becomes complex because you have to consider not only which sales channels are you selling on, but now where have you, where have you experienced enough economic activity to now justify charging sales tax and know to turn on your channels to gather in those states. And then you need to have a a plan in place for gathering or remitting because where you used to have like one sales tax return that you would file with whatever state you were in that month, you now have maybe anywhere from 15 to 30 different states that you now have a nexus relationship with. And so the complexity is around understanding where you should be charging then making sure you're set up to make sure that every time you do have a sale in that state, all of your channels are set up correctly to charge in those states. And then have you established the relationship with the state to now become like, I hate using the word compliant because it's such a freaking accounting term. And I hate not, I try not to sound like an accountant, um, but sometimes I just can't help myself. Um, (laughs) Like, how do you, are you prepared to be compliant? Are you prepared to communicate with the states? Have you registered with them? Are you, are you remitting the sales tax returns on a timely basis? Because states are becoming more and more aggressive about going after e-commerce sellers who have not taken this problem seriously. And so that, we call it like the, the, the problem that will burn your e-commerce business down if you do not engage in it with a high level of like deliberateness. Yeah, yeah. I think this is probably one of the reasons why a lot of retailers um, shy away from moving online because they feel like there's going to be a world of complexity. But, um, I, you know, on a personal level, I just remind all of them that, you know, uh, having an e-commerce business is sort of an imperative. And I also feel that Um, there's a ton of resources. In fact, we're putting together so many different useful tactics and strategies and these videos to really help those retailers that are kind of struggling and, and kind of need that little gentle push, if you will. Uh, There's a ton of resources also out online, of course, and things you can learn. But um, apart from all the ideas of sort of do it yourself, there's also so many experts like yourself and many web developers, designers, uh, automated tax uh, sort of sales tax uh, software applications like a tax jar, like an Avalara that can take care of all of that complexity. But, but yeah, you do really need to take that initial kind of push. Um, uh, I, I want to ask just a couple of other questions before we wrap it up today. Uh, as you think about the world of e-commerce, these multi-channel sales, um, and you mentioned you're seeing some real sort of positive signs in, in your customer base. Can you talk a little bit about what are some strategies that, that maybe are working for your customers today uh, that are helping them overcome the crisis uh, or uh, any ideas that you might have suggested to them? I know it's early days. It's only been a few weeks. Uh, what also, of course, feels like years already, but, but yeah, right. any strategies you're seeing that they're putting to effect that are being really helpful in this, in this uh, difficult time? Yeah. So, so first of all, I want to say that I think that the difficulty we're dealing with right now um, 
obviously it's, it's not going to last in three or four years from now, we will actually be a significantly stronger economy for what we're going through right now because of some of the things we talked about, because of the fact that more businesses will know how to operate remotely, more companies will have launched online. Like this difficult period is, is causing people, is forcing people to have to become more aware of, their, of the financial success of their business, more capable of taking advantage of, of the online world, more, more capable of going to the cloud. And as far as like immediate strategies that we've seen, um, like our clients are our clients that are succeeding are the ones that are focusing their efforts on the channels that are going to help them right now. This is really a time to streamline. Um, one of the biggest mistakes we've seen our clients make, um, our clients that struggle the most tend to be those ones that have like eight channels. The ones that we see do the very, very best are the ones that are focusing their efforts on two or three specific channels and then putting most of their time and effort into those channels and building their success around there. When you have a million channels, um, very rarely are say like, like we have a client that has like eight channels. Other than his personal website, I mean his, his company's website, their Amazon, and I think they have like one other channel, I think eBay, all the rest of those channels are not doing more than one or 2% of their total sales. And so they're putting all of this time and effort into figuring out how to manage the posting on all these different channels, how to try to push traffic to all these different channels. And it, it really spreads them thin as a, as a seller group. And if they were just do away with those other channels that are not performing well and focus instead on the channels that are, um, they're wasting a lot less time and effort. Um, also like really considering um, like their inventory movement. And it, it, there was a day and age where you could just afford to invest a whole bunch of money, maybe even take out loans with high interest rates to get your inventory into a warehouse so you could buy in high bulk. But our clients that do really well are the ones who have really figured out how to turn over their inventory that they have as quickly as possible. Um, the clients that our clients that are really struggling right now are those who made huge investments into inventory versus the ones who have who have established supply chains that allow for them to have a, a quicker turnaround time and less disruption around that. And then they don't have to forecast out as far. They don't have to gamble as, as, as aggressively as the clients who um, are only able to source in ways that require them to make huge purchases a couple times a year. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and, uh, in terms of tactical steps, so, you know, I'm a retailer, I'm listening to this video and I want to get going. Um, I, I, I've got all my stock, my store is shut. I need to get online. You, you talked about Shopify, WooCommerce, BigCommerce. I've picked a store. I'm ready to go. Um, could, you, could you lay out maybe a couple of tactical steps that you think are critical for them to succeed in this time? Yeah. So first of all, I would say that selling on Amazon is a little bit like being in an abusive relationship. And the reason why it's so That's, that's the first time I've heard described that way, but yeah, nice. Right. It's so true. And those who have taken the time and effort to establish their own stores, they just maintain so much more control over everything. And so as far as tactical steps, like I, I have never set up a Shopify store. We've never gotten involved on that side of things, but I do know that our, our clients that sell on Amazon only tend to sell products and our clients that tend to sell on their own, on the, in their own stores are building brands. And they have a lot more control across the board of how they're perceived, how they're priced. Um, you know, Shopify can just all of a sudden decide they're not going to let anything into the FBA that's not considered essential. They can all of a sudden change their, their algorithms so that you don't show up or rank anymore. When you are selling on your own channels, you have significantly more control. You're building something that it may be more work and it may be more effort, but like I said, we all have a lot of time on our hands right now. Well, except for accountants who are like panics like crazy to try to keep their clients alive. But like, because, because for the most part, economic activity has dropped. We have time now to invest in things that we may not have considered before because we just didn't have the time to, to launch it. So tactical wise, I would say really consider where you really want to be as a business three or four years from now and spend this time that you have, especially because, you know, your, your payroll can be covered for the next two months, um, where you want to be and invest your time and effort in where you want to be four years from now and not just, oh, one other thing that I would say is that in the, in the, in the webinar series that we've been doing, we've been really talking about 
understanding how to break out your cost of goods sold and your expenses, which I would say like everything other than cost of goods hold, good sold is like an overhead expense. You need to understand what your cost of goods sold are and where that differentiator is because cost of goods sold are essential costs to sell and overhead is not. Anything that falls into the category of overhead are expenses that could be cut or diminished without necessarily impacting your ability to sell a product. They can be scaled back and you can still stay alive. Cost of goods sold are the only costs you have as a business that are directly related to the sales and actually absolutely, like you can't sell a product that you have never bought to sell, but you can warehouse out of the back of your garage or you can um, like figure out how to do your own marketing yourself or you can like, um, you know, there's, there's costs you can cut on the overhead side without impairing your ability to stay alive as a business. Um, figure out what those costs are and, and, and trim things up now so that you're prepared to grow, survive, so you can thrive. Right. Very, very, very nicely put. Uh, I think that's a fantastic um, note to end on. I'll just say uh, it is a very tough time out there for retailers. And uh, I really appreciate the time you've spent to try to help them. Uh, we're building this, uh, this new site called Beat It as really a, a free resource. Uh, and these videos are really just meant to inspire and hopefully provide some guidance for everyone that, that's struggling out there and that needs some help in getting moving online. Um, again, Brittany Brown, she's the founder and CEO of Ledger Gurus. We'll put a link up to your site. And then Brittany, I know you, you guys do a great job with your webinars and lots of great content on your site. So we'll also put some links up there so that uh, people can get some additional information. Uh, thank you for your time, Brittany. And uh, if you could just uh, tell us a few things to, to close the show. Yeah. So thank you very much for having me. I appreciate that. And I just want to say like this time will pass. It will. This time will pass. Um, and, and those of you who are deliberate about the way you use this time, it's going to pass one way or the other. Um, I've seen tremendous growth within our organization within a short period of time by just having to suddenly and swiftly change our focus and the way that we approach things. Same thing with my family. And I'll tell you what I tell my kids right now who have suddenly all this time on their hands. Two months, four months, however long it's going to be, will pass no matter how you choose to invest your time. You could have either used it panicking and freaking out or you can use it to invest in your own growth and your own development and the, and the further growth and development of your business. But one way or the other, the time will pass. Where are you going to come out of it on the other side? Thank you. Thank you. Those are fantastic words. And everyone out there, I hope you stay healthy, stay home. Uh, and uh, we look forward to coming out of this crisis. And hopefully we can all come together and really beat this. Uh, thank you, Brittany. Really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.